And welcome, everyone, to continuing coverage of the Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever Championship Tournament. This is it, folks. By the time this episode is complete, we will have our first ever Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever Champion. We are eager to get right into the action, but first, before we do anything else, we have a very exasperated head official, Ray, heading up to the microphone. Let's hear what Ray has to say. I'm getting my belt. You guys need to shut up. Don't say I didn't warn you. I gave you all plenty of heads up to be quiet, but you couldn't listen, so sucks to be you. Now let's start our first matchup of the evening. The first matchup we have is Noel with his choice of Malcolm X facing off against his choice of the Godfather. Now the Friends Talking Nerdy Rules Committee did anticipate this occurring, so two scenarios were set up in place that the participant has to choose from. One, they can choose to argue both choices and leave it to the judges, or two, we can simply flip a coin. Some element of randomness has to be involved in this decision so somebody does not uh, have a chance to let one they are really confident going through. After all, it is a competition. So we are ready. Let's head to the ring area and see what Noel decides. Is he going to argue both choices or will he flip a coin? Well, I guess uh, what? let's uh, flip a coin. That's the best way. Wow. Right. You're not going to argue? Okay. <laughs> he's got a lot of talking to do. He's got a lot in the, uh, the <laughs> upcoming bracket, so I don't think he wants to play around. Yeah. yeah. Because look at this thing. If I pick the Godfather, the Godfather... Actually, you know what? They'll slash that. You know what? I'll, I'll make an argument for the Godfather. I think that's that's probably the, bit, the greatest one I think on the list. But, so I'm going to change my mind, and I will argue I will argue the Godfather. But you have Dude, to... I you know have to, you. That's you, so funny. I knew you were going to do that. If, if, no, 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 no. You have to argue both as if it were a regular match. Oh. And then we pick. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Christ. Yeah, we can't but just that's give it to like, you. I know, no. He, he's a huge Godfather fan, so I, I know the argument's going to be better for Godfather. He's going to just slump it. <laughs> oh man! Wow! Should we argue, just have a round I, robin? I argue like, myself twice now, mind you, twice. Yeah. I argue myself. Yeah. Can yeah. you do it? Let's say we could do a round robin discussion and pick what do we want. No, I think this. I mean, for the sake of time, one, but two in a tournament level, we gotcha. the, the performer in question has to has to make that choice too. So. All right. You know what? Uh, let's let's. Uh, I said it before. I said it. All right. Let's let's flip, flip a coin. All right. I think I have a coin. I have a coin, too. Are you going to flip the coin? Hold on. No, no, no. You can't let him flip the damn coin. No. <laughs> All right, I got a coin here. I've got a quarter. What do you have? I got a quarter. So, go ahead. And... Hello, what's heads? What's tails? It's Malcolm X, tails, godfather. There you go. All right, here we go. I got the coin in my hand right now. What year is the coin? Does it matter? Oh, it my does. God. Go fuck. <laughs> Someone hit him. Who's near him? All right, here we go. And the coin is being flipped. Worst coin flip I've ever seen. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Didn't even hear a ting. Ooh, it's tails. The Godfather wins! There you go. Okay. Godfather advances to the next round. And there you have it, folks. The Godfather, Noel's Choice, advances on to the next round, leading us to our next matchup. We have Sterling with his choice of Pulp Fiction, facing off against Mora with her choice of Trading Places. Sterling is up at the podium right now. Let's hear what he has to say. Pulp Fiction has probably one of the best plot development systems that I had ever seen, because I had actually never experienced it in a film, where it starts out at the end, kind of flips around, and it hodgepodges it all together. Uh, one of my favorite scenes is when you start off with uh, Christopher Walken. You have one of the best monologues about this ass watch that this guy has kept up his... Well, his dad, uh, uh, man, Bruce Willis's dad, kept this watch up his butt, died, gave it to his friend. His friend keeps the watch up his butt, and then finally gets it back to this kid... And then this little kid who's watching, uh, freaking, what was it? Um, uh, he was watching a show, and he's just like, who is this guy? Why is he giving me this butt watch? And then it turns into a major plot development when they're running away from the mob, and his, he asks his girlfriend to get my butt watch before we leave, and then it gets left on the banister, and then he's just like, oh shit, I have to get this butt watch. It was one of the funniest 
little snippets of a movie that ever, ever occurred. And then you get more butt stuff when two of the main characters are in a room about to die in a way, most likely. It, it ended up being pretty gross because one of them gets raped. And then on top of all of this butt stuff, they work together to fight these weird guys in a gimp. So these, like, hodgepodge of villains. It's just a wonderful, wonderful recreation of a film that sews everything up together and in the end just delivers an excellent, excellent performance. It's a shit ton of fun. It's super memorable. And it is just an awesome film about butt stuff. (laughs) Oh, my God. You ever see one of those things where it's like, explain a movie badly, but people know exactly what you're talking about? You talked about rape so gleefully. Oh, man, it was so funny. I, I like, I don't, I, I'm, okay. I'm sorry for saying that in, like, a very funny way, but, like... And I feel bad for laughing at it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Proving once again to our listening audience that, indeed, Sterling brings the butt stuff. All right, we are on to our next competitor. That is Mora defending her choice of trading places. She is heading up to the podium right now. Let's hear what she has to say. Mora, are you ready? Okay. Please. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, starting timer one, two. Okay, so I'm going to talk about trading places. I'm not even going to touch on anything Sterling just said. Um, Trading places... You had such an amazing cast on this, and the plot, and this is a movie that still, if you watch it today, if you have, if, you know, if you grab a 10 year, 12 year old who, you know, just sits down and watches the movie, it still stands. They're still going to be laughing their ass off. Um, what I love about this movie as well is, is Jamie Lee Curtis's character, because here's somebody who, you know, she's a hooker, she's from a small town. And she is just, like, I think one of the strongest characters. And still she has a heart of gold that she was able to see Dan Aykroyd and figure out that, yeah, he never worked a day in his life. Something bad just happened, and she still had that trustingness. Even though, you know, she's playing a hooker, she still takes him in, and she cares for him. So I love the love story that evolves in this. Um, I love that. Then just the fact, the way Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy's characters, the way they play off each other, and then they, how they wind up coming together, and just how, how fate happens, and they wind up going after the Duke brothers, which I thought was brilliant, um, and just so enjoyable in watching how everything unfolds, and seeing how the characters develop. It's just, it's something that you can totally see, and something that, like, you think, like, wow, this is totally believable and can happen. Um... And even um, Eddie Murphy at the time, the fact that he would do a couple of scenes looking straight into the camera, breaking down that fourth wall, that was something that was unique for its time when that movie came out. And that's what it was actually known for, because it's something that normally does not happen in a movie. So that was also kind of cool. Um, the lines, I can't even begin to go into like how many funny lines are in that movie and just like the way it ends. Um you know, them making it. I thought that was just awesome. Damn it. Okay. All right. And we bring it to the judges. What will they choose? Will it be trading places from Mora or will Sterling's argument about butt stuff in relation to Pulp Fiction have been impactful? And the judges have reached their decision. They are heading it my way. Heading on to round number four to face off against the Godfather is Mora with Trading Places. Our next matchup, a sees bull- Bullet, Noel's choice, facing off against Mora with her choice of Star Wars Episode Four. Noel is heading up to the podium right now. Let's hear what he has to say. What can I say about Bullet and Star Wars Episode Four? Well, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll let Mora do that. I'll just, for me... I think that you have... I, I, I want to make a point. Someone kept saying about one... I think a judge broke about part of the fact about chase sequence. Yes, there's a chase sequence in the movie, but it's towards the end. It really leads up to that sequence, which is why I, didn't try, I tried to avoid mentioning the same chase sequence when I defended uh, French Connection. But if you take the chase sequence out of the movie, just the interaction between the characters and the storyline, the plot of it, keeps the film going. This chase is just, is, is, is just a criminal crap. Actually, 
actually is not. The, bit, the big sequence is when they actually catch the bad guys. I think the film itself, uh, you know, a classic 60s movie, McQueen's cool, kind of like I argued last time. But I think more in terms of just a pure story, the movie really moves. It really, ha you have, you, you're, you're sticking with the bullet to see if and when, you know, if he's going to catch this guy, hopefully he does, or exact some justice, or will he get away? I think also that, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, when Star Wars came out, that changed a generation. So, in significance, I get why Star Wars A New Hope is a much more culture than film than Bullet. I just think Bullet's a great film because it's a great film. And I think the merits of that, of, of that really make the film, you know, a, 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 that's why I argued for it. I think it just kind of brings a great storyline, the way the way the film moves, you're interested in the characters, and at some point you're, there's, you cannot wait for the resolution because it's coming, it's building up to this moment. And what what good film doesn't have that? This great kind of build up where, where, where it comes to that point. Is this, this going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Who knows? I mean, the film itself is dated, it's not kind of like everybody's list. It is a cinephile kind of great. But for me, I think uh, Steve McQueen's Bullets, is, is, it's a classic. One of my favorite movies. Noel wraps up his argument for Bullet, leading us to Mora, who is setting up to the podium right now to defend Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Let's hear what she has to say. So, Bullet, yes, it was a good film, but it just can't compare with Star Wars. Here you have... The action, I mean, if we're going to compare as far as action scenes, uh, you know, visually, Star Wars, it's just so phenomenal. And it's just something that when you sit in there, if you, if you ever, this is definitely a movie you have to see in the theater. And if you didn't see it in the theater, at least, like, have the surround sound and have, like, a good screen. Because it's something, it's visually, it's so amazing and so pleasing and the special effects, they really did an amazing job, um, especially at the time when it came out, because that was something, like, unlike now, we didn't have that much green screen and CGI. We didn't really have any CGI back then, to say. But anyways, you know, so between visually being amazing, the music score, just the music that went along, like, you know, when Luke went back, um, he went after C-3PO, came home, and he found... You know, his Uncle Ben and everybody burned, and it's like that music, it was so heartfelt. And it's something that just stays with you after years and years of watching this over and over again. I mean, for every time they came out with, you know, the director's cut, the uncut, you know, digitally remastered, it's just still phenomenal. Um, and the cast, obviously, again, I can't even, I, I can't, I don't know what else to say. They were just so phenomenal, and the fact that, Princess Leia, again, like, here she is a princess, and I love the scene how when she is confronted with Darth Vader, and the way she stands up to him, and it's like, here you have, like, this little girl with Cinnabons on her hair, and not to say she's a little girl, but it's just somebody, like, you don't think is that strong, and the fact that she had such moxie, um was just amazing, you know, she, like, she, she, the way her, the force was so beyond amazing, and... Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. We bring it to the judges. What will they choose? Will it be Bullet from Noel, or will it be Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope from Mora? The judges are deliberating, and they have come to a decision. They are sending it my way. And the winner of the match heading on to the next round is going to be Mora with Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Our next matchup pits Tim with his choice of Kill Bill Volume 1, facing off against Mora with her choice of Dead Alive. Tim is heading up to the podium right now. Let's hear what he has to say. All right, Kill Bill Volume 1. You know, we've already touched upon uh, some uh, of the aspects that I do like about the movie. Um, you know, once again, with a Quentin Tarantino movie, the soundtrack... Um, no, the, the, at least for Kill Bill Volume 1 still not an original soundtrack Volume 2 of course did utilize uh, Robert Rodriguez um, you know, scoring most of the movie but we did have some great pieces from uh, RZA we had some classic songs from uh, Nancy Sinatra um, and they even had the, uh, a little sound clip from uh, the old TV show Ironside that you know that, that sound effect that occurred when uh, the bride saw one of her um, one of her enemies, um, and then you know some of the actors uh, in the film, like Vivica A. Fox, 
why does she not get more work? Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, we, we know why, and that's just representation being what it is. Hollywood is racist in a lot of ways. But she kicks a major ass in that film, and she, for, for, for a role that, you know, in Kill Bill Volume 1, she was, you know, on screen for, what, 10, 15 minutes? But her performance really... Uh, struck a chord with me, you know, the fact that, you know, when her daughter came home and that, that, that desperate look in her eye with Beatrix, she wanted to continue the fight, but she also wanted to be there for her daughter. Um, that, that argument, uh, that, uh, Beatrix and Vivica Fox character had in her kitchen, uh, was great as well. Cause I think one aspect of the battles that people don't take into account with Kill Bill are the emotional battles that occur. And uh, this was the first emotional battle that they had. It was a war of words, but it was it, it was so emotional. And then, you know, when uh, Beatrix ends up killing Vivica Fox character and then her daughter's there, a brilliant setup for a potential third movie that it sounds like may not get made, but just wonderful acting throughout. Tim wraps up his arguments for Kill Bill Volume 1. Maura is heading up to the podium right now to defend Dead Alive. Let's hear what she has to say. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about more about Dead Alive, because this is definitely a movie, whether you watch it sober, buzz, whatever, it's still by yourself with friends. It's still just a fun, great movie that you cannot just sit there and not laugh and not be grossed out and kind of be disturbed, but all in a great, fun-filled way. Um, you ha So, again, the main character, Lionel, the transition that he goes through, so if you look at it, A, this movie's actually a love story, and also it's kind of, it's a progression of how he becomes a man because it starts off with him being like this little mama's boy who has to kind of sneak out of the house, and he's a grown man, mind you. He has to sneak out of the house to go on a date with this Spanish girl, um, Paquita, who's like totally, like she's enamored by him. She's just so head over heels crazy about him. Why, we don't know, but um, he sneaks out, and the mother actually follows him, and they wound up going to a zoo, and that's how the mother gets bitten by that rat monkey that turns into the zombie. So, you know, the whole... Everything that ensues afterwards, like all the, you know, everybody slowly turning into zombie because it's like one bite scratch after another. And then, like I said earlier, next thing you know, Lionel's taking care of anybody who turns into a zombie. He's taking care of them in his basement. And on top of that, he has this really gross uncle who comes over who kind of forces himself into the house and winds up having a party. And that's where all the whole bloodbath scene comes in. And towards the end, the mother turns into this huge creature and she basically loves her son so much she's trying to actually push him back into the womb which i think is the most hysterical thing and there's so like there's an underlying message there um kind of disturbing if you think about it where the mother doesn't want to let him go but he has to grow up and he winds up killing her so end of story and <laughs> that's it that's my time <laughs> And we bring it to the judges. What will be their choice? Will it be Kill Bill Volume 1 from Tim, or will it be Dead Alive from Mora? And the judges have reached a decision. They are sending it my way. And the winner of the match, heading on to round number four, is going to be Tim with his choice of Kill Bill Volume 1. Our next matchup, we have Sterling with his choice of Forrest Gump facing off against Noel with his choice of JFK. Noel is actually heading up first to the podium. Let's hear what he has to say. So, the movie JFK, how can you compare JFK to Forrest Gump? Now, supposedly, the last argument was uh, JFK, you can watch JFK stuff on um, History Channel. Uh, yeah, you can, you do that. And it's funny, the film Forrest Gump is actually takes place based on what happened when, when JFK. You know, there's a scene where Forrest actually meets a uh, Mr. President, he says he has to go pee, which I think is kind of funny. So, how about that? I just think in terms of films, JFK is a better film. And the main reason why is you have all this acting talent in this film. We can, I can, I'm going to just start naming off like Gary Oldman as uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. You have Joe Pesci in this movie. You have uh, Kevin Bacon. So, if you're a Kevin Bacon fan, The Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, this is like a good film for The Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. You have, um, you, you have Jack Lemmon. You have Walter Matthau. You have Donald Sutherland, who plays X, who really sets up everything for Kevin Costner. So you see SpaceX in this movie. Uh, um, Laurie Metcalf, uh, Michael Rooker. I can, you know, it, it's that, that itself. But 
even without the actors, even without that, the fact that you had a t- attorney in New Orleans come up with the theory that it is possible that JFK was assassinated to cover these things out, and the fact that the film still keeps conspiracy theories and the possibility of this being true makes me it makes you make you even want to watch the movie even more. The film is long, where you know Gump has his moments because of the silliness of that, and I think that's fine. But with JFK, which doesn't really talk about his family as much, it really talks about when he was in office and the ideals that he had to you know for the country, and the fact that he was taken out when these things would have would have changed the country kind of says that, and it's kind of more happening today. So for me, I think one of Austin's greatest films, JFK. Noel wraps up his arguments for JFK, which brings us Sterling, who's heading up to the podium right now to defend Forrest Gump. Let's hear what he has to say. I only need one name, and it's Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks fucking makes this film. Tom Hanks kills it throughout this entire film. He is believable. He is lovable. He is huggable and gullible. And other words that are ullable. Tom Hanks is just precious throughout this movie. You have an amazing film with amazing just teams, supporting actors, but it again just revolves around Forrest Gump in these wonderful situations. And it is just so well portrayed, so simple, so easy, just with Tom Hanks alone. And then on top of that, you have just history as a co-star, and history does its job. The uh, introduction of, like, green screens and certain um, effects and no, like, over-the-top crazy CGI or whatever, but you have the appropriate amount of effect when you have, like, a strafing run of napalm. Um, You have uh, Tom Hanks kind of cropped into history. It's an amazing film. It will always hold up. It is great. You don't have to speculate. You just have fun. You enjoy. You don't have to have any sort of bias. It's just like, oh, JFK, he was a nice man. He died. His brother, also a nice man. He died. And then it gets you interested in history, and then you can go back and look and kind of find your own bias. It doesn't matter. Forrest Gump is just a great, great film that is so much fun for everybody, and it stands on its own. Tom Hanks stands on its own. History stands on its own. Boom. The end. We bring it to the judges. What will be their choice? Will it be JFK from Noel or Forrest Gump from Sterling? And the judges have reached a decision. They are sending it my way. And the winner of the match, heading on to round number four, is Sterling with Forrest Gump. Our next matchup pits Noel with his choice of the deer hunter facing off against Noel with his choice of Shaft. Let's hear how he will choose to proceed. Will he choose to argue both choices, or will he choose to flip a coin? Let's head to the ring. Once again, Noel, um, you have a choice to either argue both, or we can flip a coin. We're going to flip a coin. All right. Don't play with himself again. <laughs> Whoa! Wow! That needs to be recorded. That needs to be taped and kept on and played over and over and over again. French that's, talking. That's, that's the best sound by the show. French. Is that going to be my new ringtone? <laughs> yes, it's going to be. Yeah. It's no, it's playing with himself. Friends, <laughs> friends talking nerdy like after dark. House that you have. <laughs> yeah. That's friends true. talking naughty. <laughs> <laughs> That was episode 28. Yeah. um, (laughs) All right. um, So then we will do heads will be the deer hunter. Tails will be shaft. Got the coin in my hand right now. A bated breath. The bad motherfuckers advancing to the next round. Shaft wins. And as you've just heard in the ring, Shaft is moving on to round number four. Our next matchup is Tim with his choice of Planet of the Apes, facing off against Noel with his choice of MASH. Tim is up at the podium right now. Let's hear what he has to say. Planet of the Apes, I've said a lot about it already. Um, You know, and as we've told the judges before, we can either argue for our movie or argue against uh, our, our opponent's movie. In this case with MASH, 
if it were not for the TV show, I think this film would have been in the dustbin of history. It was not a good representation of what MASH could have been. And again, this is someone who has seen every episode of the TV show. I've read the original books that all of this was based off of. Um, you have high, high quality acting talent in that film, but apart from Robert Duvall um, as, uh, as, as Major Burns, who I think did, was, was probably the only actor in that movie who did a better job than the TV counterpart, it, it just was not cast right in my opinion and the overall story didn't have a clear linear you know beginning to end type of deal it was just random events that occurred and just I, it, when I finished watching that movie I was more confused than anything else um, I mean if it, 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 compared to Planet of the Apes from beginning to end great sci-fi movie great message at the end about you know th that of, of how we are treating our planet now will definitely uh, uh, you know, destroy life as we know it, uh, as we know it. So having, it, it's a message that especially today, I mean, when you got a nut job in the White House, it, it's a message that we have to be cognizant of. So um, I would say if you're considering the judging, consider the movie that, that is the most important in this case. And that movie, in my opinion, of the two is going to be Planet of the Apes. And Tim wraps up his defense of Planet of the Apes, bringing us Noel, who's heading up to the podium right now to defend the movie MASH. Let's hear what he has to say. Yeah, so Tim made a very legitimate argument about, in comparison of films, about, you know, why you shouldn't vote for MASH. But I can say a film dealing with folks in situations where war's around them, in these times, I think that film is more relevant than ever. And I think that it, it, as a society, we need to understand how the actions of war affect those who have to deal with soldiers in harm's way. So having a medical unit dealing with that, I think, really emphasize that. And you can throw in some political stuff. Like, like Tim, like, like, like said, Tim, I am a fan of TV show like you. I've seen every episode thousands of times. And when it comes on TV, I, I do catch it. I just think for, for, for me, in comparison to Planet of the Apes, where you have a film dealing with the social commentary of man's actions with, with the planet, and something that 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 is a that is a far-fetched ideal of, of the apes taking over, it's possible it could be. I think in terms of films like *Mash*, is more realistic. It's more what people can relate to. It's something that we that I think we cannot ignore nowadays. The fact that we, like, the, I, as argument for against it, you know, with, with, with the present current office and what's happening around the world, even what's going on in Syria, I think a film like this asks that question about this, because we, we as a society, especially in this country, don't seem to understand how war really affects those in that area. You know, we kind of think about it, unless you are, you, you know that situation, but, you know, let's say, it's, you know, how, how can you fathom being in an environment where you can be killed at a moment's notice? You don't know if you're going to, if you're going to be alive one day and next day second. As morbid as it sounds. So you have a film dealing with that, but you have a sense of comedy and a sense of uh, of that with, within it to soothe that point over. So for me, I think MASH in Times Day is the most significant film compared to Pan of Planet of the Apes. It's time to go to the judges. What will be their pick? Will it be Planet of the Apes from Tim or will it be MASH from Noel? Let's find out. The judges have reached a decision. They're sending it my way. And the winner of the match, heading on to round number four, is going to be Tim with his choice of Planet of the Apes. Now we are up to our last matchup of round number three, that it will be Tim's choice of Blazing Saddles facing off against Tim's choice of Enter the Dragon. And in the ring area, it looks like Tim has made no effort to, want to indicate that he wants to argue these out, so it looks like we are going to flip a coin. Let's head to the ring area and see what occurs. Blazing Saddles will be heads. Enter the Dragon will be tails. Are you serious? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Do we oh, really want to hear Tim argue head. that long? <laughs> <laughs> With himself? <laughs> you know I can do it. <laughs> hey, that would have been interesting. <laughs> Here we go. The winner of the match. Advancing to Why the is next Tim round. the coin? Is Blazing Saddles. 
Awesome. If we have another... T- no, see, you're going to... Ah, uh, fuck. I'm <laughs> All right. We had some controversy in the ring surrounding the decision, but the rules are the rules. And the winner of the match, heading on to round number four, is Tim with his choice of Blazing Saddles. Round number four begins. And the first matchup we are going to see will be Noel with his choice of The Godfather, facing off against Mora with her choice of Trading Places. Noel is at the podium right now. Let's hear what he has to say. How can you compare these two movies? One's a great comedy. One, you know, it's it's the film that really launched Eddie Murphy, made him a superstar. Incredible plot twist, you know, a plot situation to catch them together. And 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 I, it's one of my favorite movies. It's one of the few films that that comes on. But there's some issues, uh, you know, with that film. You know, no one talks about the question of Dan Aykroyd in blackface playing Jamaican. So I always thought about that watching the movie. I was like, that's kind of funky. But you know, neither here nor there. The film still is a good is is a good film. As for the Godfather argument, what I can really say in terms of just pure story, a character who who tries his hardest to stay out of the family business gets drawn in by the death of his by the accidental you know by the kill almost attempted death of his father. How I mean how what how how can you not want to watch a drama like that? Where what may what caused his son to go into his father's deadly lifestyle? Right, the film starts off. We realize how how powerful that his father is, Don Corleone. What things he can do and not do. And we find out how other people in his uh, in the so-called lifestyle of his are powerful as well. When an opportunity comes up to make money, there starts a double cross. Double cross happens. You know, Don Don gets Don gets killed. Attempts to get killed. Sorry. Michael, who totally's out of it, comes in. You know, you know, kills the guy who's responsible. Has to go to Italy to hide out. They find him. They kill. They try to kill him there. Comes back to the states, cold as ever. Now running an organization with his father, who's retired, being his consul, being his consulary. Consulary, right? Then you know, so he gets all these things happen. So for me, I think The Godfather is one of those films that you have a unique story that all comes together. It's a classic film, but a really, really classic film story. And Noel wraps up his argument of The Godfather. Moore is heading up to the podium right now to discuss Trading Places. Let's hear what she has to say. All right, so Trading Places. Godfather, yes, it's a classic, but so is Trading Places. This is a movie, you know, watch over and over and over again. And I have to say, this. so this is a funny story, how I did not see Trading Places in, in the theater. I actually, and I don't even think I heard about it until... I was in high school, I was a freshman in high school, and my social studies teacher brought it up. Like, she actually mentioned it, because there was so many lessons to be learned in this movie, and, you know, there was the whole level of the classes, um, you know, so you have that aspect of it. You have, you know, the genetic versus environment aspect, um, just like human nature and the way, you know, everybody's being treated and, you know, who you are, you know, what you do and who you are. So there's a lot of all these like little lessons, you know, in the undertone of it all. And the fact that it's still relevant to today, um, the, you know, if I'm really happy they never remade this movie, because I thought this movie, like it's just brilliantly done the way they did it. And the fact that the cast and the way they played it off one another, um, it's, it's just an all-time classic, and you can watch this over and over again. And the way they, you know, they even explained how, you know, when Eddie Murphy became um, with the Dukes, and they're trying to explain to him what commodities are, and he basically just said, oh, so you guys are just a couple of bookies. You know, I thought, again, that's another brilliant line, and they, how they broke it down, where it's like, you know, to the upper class, it's Wall Street and commodities, and to the lower class, it's just gambling and bookies. So, again, like, really hysterical stuff and just um the way it was all incorporated and um i don't know eddie murphy and dan Aykroyd, you could just never go wrong with them it's just the way they play everything off it off of each other was just so well done and moral wraps up her argument for trading places will that be enough to sway the judges let's find out as the judges have reached a decision and they're handing it my way and the winner of the match being our first entrant into the final four 
is Noel with his choice of The Godfather. Our next matchup is Mora with her choice of Star Wars Episode 4, facing off against Tim with his choice of Kill Bill Volume 1. Mora's up at the podium. Let's hear what she has to say. All right, so Star Wars versus Kill Bill. Um, yeah, Kill Bill, great action film. Um, a lot of good scenes, but Star Wars hands down beats it. I mean, this is... How do I... How can I keep describing how amazing aesthetically this movie is? Mus- musicality, um, the cast, the plot. Um, it had robots, for God's sakes. You know, C-3PO and R2-D2, which were not just amazing, cool robots, but they were also the comic relief, you know? And they were the way they... They were characters in of themselves. Like, you know, so that just contributed to... The whole storyline, which just made this movie like 20 times better. Um, Chewbacca, also, it's like, who doesn't love Chewbacca? I mean, there are so many characters that were drawn off of Chewbacca for other movies and even um, for toys, for God's sakes, which was one of my favorites. Luke, and basically for this story, Luke... I always like to think of, like, with Harry Potter, it's like, here you have a kid who's just like a farm boy, just living on his own, you know, like, living with his uncle and thinking, like, this kind of sucks, and he wants more out of life, and next thing you know, he discovers the Force and how he actually has powers, and, you know, it goes from there, and then the story just develops, and he finds, and then it goes on to, like, all these sequels, and, like, it has a whole, whole long line that still today movies are being made, you know, with this original cast that, you know, best in peace, who's still alive. And, you know, it's just, this is just something that stays with you throughout time, that it's just an cl- amazing classic with, and even like the, the fighting scenes out in space, for God's sakes. I mean, <laughs> okay, damn it. Mora wraps up her arguments for Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Which brings us to him, who's setting up to the podium right now to defend Kill Bill Volume 1. Let's hear what he has to say. Earlier on in the tournament, when uh, Mora faced off against Noel uh, with Episode 4 versus Episode 5, um, I was surprised uh, of the outcome. You know, you're not going to hear me say that Episode 4 is a bad film, but it is not the superior film. As a standalone film among the Star Wars movies, I don't think that this one necessarily stands the test of time. It did start the fire of what the Star Wars franchise became, um, but as a standalone, for me, it ranks down there with The Phantom Menace in terms of quality. Um, whereas with Kill Bill Volume 1 is a great standalone film, a great cliffhanger leading into uh, the, the second movie. Lots of great action throughout. Um, again, the acting is tremendous, and I think it, it, it expands upon the, um, the the role of women in these types of movies that uh, Star Wars Episode Four kind of introduced, because even though Carrie Fisher was a badass character as Princess Leia in that movie, she really was, most of the time, given the damsel in distress role of just sitting there waiting for the guys to help her out. Um, whereas with with uh, Kill Bill, Beatrix Kiddo, she, the, the, the training she went through to get back into shape to fight everybody on the Deadly Viper assassination squad... She went through hell and back to get her revenge on Bill. So don't let the entire Star Wars franchise cloud your opinion on that one movie. Rank that movie on its merits alone, and if you truly do, it does not stand up to Kill Bill Volume 1. Thank you. We bring it to the judges. What will be their choice? Will it be Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope from Mora, or will it be Kill Bill Volume 1 from Tim? And the judges have reached a decision. They are sending it my way. The winner of the match, heading on to the semifinals to face off against Noel with his choice of The Godfather, is 
Mora with her choice of Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Our next matchup pits Sterling with his choice of Forrest Gump facing off against Noel with his choice of Shaft. And remember, folks, this is actually Sterling's last entrant in the tournament. This is do or die for him. How will he perform? He's heading up to the podium right now. Let's hear what he has to say. Forrest Gump is a testament to time in a sense of its work. You have just excellent, excellent themes, stories, plots. You have abandonment. You have family. You have friendship. All of these work together so well throughout the film. You have Forrest's best friend, Bubba, that he... Watch die in his hands, man. That shit is just fucking terrible. And then on top of that, he was such a good friend with him and to him that he opened up his own shrimp boat business, involved his family, got his family in it. You have um, Forrest's mother who gets diagnosed with cancer and dies. You have Lieutenant Dan who has his legs blown off. You have this character who's so charismatic that not only does he save the man, he saves an entire platoon. You have a man who feels so lost that he just runs around the United States trying to find purpose. Um, you just have an amazing, emotional, touching film. And there's, there's laughs, there's fun times, there's sad times. All of this working together, you just have an amazing experience. It comes to a wonderful head with, you know, Forrest having his own son, taking care of his own kid, passing on this experience to them, and it could set up for another movie. It's an American classic. It's just a great movie all around. Best movie of all time. Sterling wraps up his arguments for Forrest Gump, and Noel is heading up, up to the podium right now to defend Shaft. Let's hear what he has to say. Okay, so how can I compare? How can you compare Shaft to Forrest Gump? You really can't. Forrest Gump, you know, you have. A, is it a great film? The film's all right. It's, it's, I mean, I mean, it's so what America is about today. To be totally oblivious to see what's going on through history, and I have, and I have an idea what's happening. I get some of these points about the, about that, but I have a, I think in comparison to Shaft, a film about more relevant and more interesting topic in terms of dealing with situations in the real world, trying to do right, makes a much better film than a, than a clueless bumpkin flying, you know, you know, going through history, you know, all these things, and it's, it's just kind of like being a little observer. And I think, and I, I had a big problem with it when I saw that film. I thought that. I mean, when I, I was just kind of like, the time that film came out, that was, that's what America was going through. You know, you know, George W. was in office, this kind of like, oh no, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that, I apologize. That was, uh, see, it's 96, so, Clint, so it was uh, Clinton, I apologize. So, through that time, you know, the, the, the U.S. was going through this, this mind-numbing situation, you know, I mean, some sort of hope and prosperity, but it didn't happen. And then, then comes Forrest Gump. I just, I, I think in terms of filming and in terms of storyline about it, it's just kind of mystical, but also fantasy and not very realistic. So I really didn't care about Forrest. I was more pissed off that uh, he kind of used Bubba's idea to make money. So that that's kind of seems kind of realistic. The world's working right now. Little hidden gem, even though he's his friend, takes all of that. So we can talk, you know, about how bad of a film it is. Whereas compared to a movie where you have a you have a black detective. Riding, riding that line between being soulful in Harlem and dealing with the white cops, trying to solve, trying to solve a murder situation, a murder for what happens, kidnapping of a, of a, of a, of a of underboss's daughter, and the fact that one film really set a generation off makes sense. So for me, I think Shaft is the better film than, than Forrest Gump could ever be. Noel wraps up his arguments for Shaft, bringing it to the judges. What will they choose? Will it be Forrest Gump, Sterling's choice, or Shaft, Noel's choice? And the judges have reached their decision. They are sending it my way. And the winner of the match heading on to the final four is Noel with his choice of Shaft, which officially eliminates Sterling from the tournament. Sterling is heading up to the microphone for some final comments. Let's hear what he has to say. 
Uh, you guys have shitty taste in music. <laughs> you have <laughs> shitty taste in movies. <laughs> you have shitty taste in beer. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. No, beer. I just. I am so disappointed in everybody <laughs> in so many hey, different ways. I voted ways. for a bunch of yours. You voted for Shaft when he <laughs> lied about Bubba's mom. I knew about Bubba's mom when he said that. I, I know. Like, that I, right, know. I, know. I still thought his argument was better. Okay. Good game. I hope Star Wars wins. <laughs> Star Wars will win. Star Wars. Sterling wraps up his farewell and takes his leave from the ring, heading to a seat in the ringside area to watch the rest of the competition. Now our final matchup for this round pits Planet of the Apes, Tim's Choice versus Tim's Other Choice of Blazing Saddles. And as we know, once again, could he argue those choices out or will he choose a coin flip? Let's head to the ring to find out. We're going to do a coin flip. Heads, Planet of the Apes, Tails, Blazing Saddles. Heads. I flip the coin. And if you haven't guessed already, Planet of the Apes makes its way to the final four. Our final four pits Noel with his choice of the Godfather, facing off against Mora with her, her choice of Star Wars Episode Four, and Noel with his choice of Shaft, facing off against him with his choice of Planet of the Apes. Noel is heading up to the podium right now to defend the Godfather. Let's hear what he has to say. So. How do you compare two iconic films, two films that really started filmmaking, right? Science fiction, fantasy, uh, crime, story. You have to, you know, they, they run neck and neck. They, they are, they, there's no question about that in terms of significance. So we gotta get a little more detailed. And this is gonna be about acting. I mean, there is no way you can compare Mark Hamill's performance to, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to Al Pacino. You know, Carrie Fisher, talented actress, no question about that. And I think she, you know, thinks she's, she's great. But in the terms of, of Star Wars, you know, her character's move forward was kind of stereotypical of, of, of the way which she was portrayed. But later on, we find out of, of her strength. But, you know, this, I mean, that, I mean, that's where I think Star Wars may have an advantage. Because because in The Godfather, the women are, are, are kind of treated badly, I will say that. Then you have Harrison Ford, you know, playing his you know, playing iconic character of Han Solo, setting it up. You can compare him to Marlon Brando? I, I, I don't think so. So when you look at those films together and judge them, you have to judge by the performance of acting. And more importantly, the believability of it. Star Wars sets a fantasy up, and I think it does that very well. That said, like kind of Sterling said before, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars, I get that. But in terms of ensemble and how things are put together, The Godfather wins hands down. You have you have multiple Oscar nominated folks. To put, I mean, in terms of awards, Godfather tops the list. In terms of acting awards, Godfather tops the list. Just in terms of performances itself, Godfather sets you know it sets apart, sets apart that. Even quotable lines. There are more quotable lines from Godfather than there are from Star Wars. Star Wars has an emotional attachment. I have it as well, and I agree with that. But in this case, it's Godfather. In terms of pulling back to head, Godfather's the winner. Noel wraps up his argument for the Godfather, bringing us Mora up to the podium to discuss her choice of Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Let's hear what she has to say. Okay, so yes, I agree with Noel in the sense that both are classic films. Both are a huge franchise. Star Wars is a bigger franchise, though. Definitely... Um, bigger in the sense that this is really more family oriented. So, you know, this is something you can take with to your kids. The kids at a really young age, anywhere from like four years old, they can start watching this. Um, you know, Godfather is something that's really more appreciated, you know, for the adults. It's not something that a kid would watch per se. Um, here you have something that, yes, it's complete fantasy where, you know what, you want to get out of the everyday life, and it's just amazing to sit back and to see, you know, a whole nother, like, bunch of worlds, not even just one world, bunch of worlds, different alien races, um, robots, you know, Godfather has no robots, it's kind of sad, we're the robots, I want the robots, um, you have, you know, the, I love the, the relationship between Han Solo and Chewbacca because they're, you know, 
for for a guy, you know, Han Solo is supposed to be like this rogue type of guy, and here he has like this loyal, loyal. It's not even a pet. This is a friend who's like from an alien race. Yeah, you can't understand down what he's saying, but he's like the coolest cat, one of the coolest characters there. And plus, the franchise that it brings on, you know, with Lando Calrissian, Boba Fett. It's like all these amazing characters that it brings that the franchise brings. Um, this movie can totally stand alone. Um, which was a part of the argument from before. Um, you know, it has a transition where you see Luke. Yes, he's a whiny ass kid, but you see how what he goes through in the transition. You have Obi Wan, who is like an amazing. The whole cast, it's like amazing actors. Um, are they Marlo Brando? No, but are they still amazing cast? Yes. And we bring it to the judges. What will they choose? Will it be the Godfather from Noel or Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope from Mora? And the judges have reached a decision. They are sending it my way. And the winner of the match heading on to the finals of the first ever Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever Championship Tournament is Mora with her choice of Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope. And what is this? Noel is actually heading up to the podium. He has some uh, words he has to say about this decision. Look, I, I, I've been, hey, like, listen, I've been quiet when my films are lost and I deal with that, but I'm sorry, that's BS. <laughs> no way Star Wars is better than Godfather. I know you guys feel emotional about that, I get that, but that's just, that's just play. No, I, and, I, and, more, and more importantly, I mean, hey, hey, thank you for voting for Godfather. You're awesome, you rock, you're the bomb, no question about that. But you tend to say that. I didn't even compare Mark Hamill to freaking, um, to, to Marlon Brando. I compared Harrison Ford. I compared Mark Hamill to Al Pacino. I thought you did. I thought you did. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. It is what it is. But I'm saying for the record, that's BS. <laughs> and it's like, bye. Let me know when for Shaft. That's all I got to say. And Noel goes off on the judges, still defending his movie literally to the death. All right, our final matchup in the final four here. We have Noel with his choice of Shaft, facing off against Tim with his choice of Planet of the Apes. Once again, the winner will go on to the finals of the first ever Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever Championship Tournament to face Mora with her choice of Star Wars Episode Four. Now, Noel is heading up to the podium right now to defend Shaft. Let's hear what he has to say. How can we compare Shaft to Planet of the Apes, right? How can we compare a film that deals with eradications of the environment and a possibility of spoil the end of the movie, we've realized that uh, that takes place on Earth in the future. How when, 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 when apes or primates take over. Definitely, uh, definitely relevant, definitely incredible, not, not, not debating at all. Whereas comparison to a film like Shaft, where you have a film that talks about social issues at the time, that deals with the fact that films like this were not being made, they had to be made behind the scenes, or more importantly, exploitive, even though so many ideas of Shaft are sexist and racist at that time. The original movement of the film is, um, is just like, a, it's a great story. So putting those all together, it makes it move well. In the shot of the 70s, somewhat similar to uh, Plenty of H more 60s, but when you get a kick-ass soundtrack with Isaac Hayes, that pretty much says it. When people say the name, they know what the film they're talking about automatically. And I think for entertainment value... It's up there. It's fun and enjoyable. Who does not like to watch that movie? Where it's playing the apes, it asks more social questions, and a lot of times there is the horror involved in that. Once you find out the, the turn of it, based on a couple book that Tim has said, I get it, and I think it has some merits. It's one of my films I do enjoy, but in this competition or discussion of greater films, I think Shaft has a much more significance culturally in terms of style of it, too. And also in terms of watchability, Planet of the Apes is a really detailed sci-fi film. And and somewhat it is dated. And, you know, even politics of Heston, outstanding, for some reason, he is well known. But I think for this discussion, this argument, Shaft is a much better, more simply important film for discussion. And Noel wraps up his arguments for Shaft, leading us for to Tim's final choice of the tournament, Planet of the Apes. Tim is heading up to the podium right now to defend his choice. Let's hear what he has to say. All right, Shaft. I like the movie. I own the movie. I think it's a good movie. Um, you know, in the, in the purpose of this tournament here, I think the overall goal is to 
argue why a movie is important overall. Um, Shaft definitely opened a lot of doors that needed to, to be open a long time before. As a standalone movie, though, compared to Planet of the Apes, if you took those two movies and showed them to somebody that knew nothing about either of those franchises at all, we're talking they don't know the the catchphrases, they don't know the theme songs involved, I think overall audiences would go for Planet of the Apes. It is a better story. Story overall, in my opinion, I think overall it does have the better acting. Richard Roundtree and Shaft is great, yet a lot of the act, other actors involved uh, in Shaft were wooden and gave one-dimensional performances. Whereas in uh, Planet of the Apes, uh, the the apes in question, Doctor Zaius, you know, it, it originally presented as a villain, but he knew all along what uh, Charlton Heston's character would find at the end, and you t- find out that he's not that really uh, he's not a bad guy. Um, there's just a lot of a lot of intense complexity in that story that uh, you just don't see in Shaft. Shaft, again, great story. You're not going to get an argument from me, but it is a pretty straightforward uh, private detective story. I, I you know, and I've, I, I appreciate that because I've written a couple of them, you know, um, but uh, just comparing the two movies as just stand-alone movies and not talking about their cultural impact, I think overall Planet of the Apes will be the better choice. And we bring it to the judges. What will be their decision? Will they vote in favor of Noel with his choice of Shaft, or will it be Tim with his choice of Planet of the Apes? Now the judges have reached a decision. They are sending the results my way. And here we go. The winner of the match heading on to the finals of the first ever Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever Championship Tournament to face off against Mora with her choice of Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope is... Tim with his choice of Planet of the Apes. All right, that means Noel is officially eliminated from the tournament. Noel is heading up to the podium right now for some final comments. Let's hear what he has to say. Um, it, 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 it is what it is. That's, that's you know, the, the, those other ones. So, you know, I, I got, you got to you do what you got to do. Yeah. All right. You're a lot more graceful than me, man. <laughs> I was just like, fuck all y'all. <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you. You're cool. <laughs> I thought, like, hey, this, 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 this is, to quote Godfather Part 2, this is the, pet, you know, this is the uh, career we have chosen. Okay. So I got, I did what I had to do. And this is it, folks. This is what our business is all about. It's about earning the opportunity to main event the Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever Championship Tournament. Our two participants are Mora with her choice of Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, facing off against Tim with his choice of Planet of the Apes. One of these choices will be the winner. And that winner will receive the Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever Championship Belt. Now, Mora is heading up to the podium to discuss Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Let's hear what she has to say. No, um, <laughs> we're going to flip a coin on who goes first. I'm so, if Sterling can get a coin, because I think that's fair. Okay. Heads you go, f- heads you win, tails you lose. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, heads, Moira goes first. Tails, Tim goes first. Here's a bit of a last-minute change, folks. Uh, we are flipping a coin once again to determine who will go first. Tails. I want to recount. Um. <laughs> it's 50-50. <laughs> you can pull the audience. It's still 50-50. All right. All right. And with that, in three, two... Planet of the Apes. Without that movie, there would be no Star Wars Episode IV. Um, George Lucas has been on record uh, stating that in the build-up for Episode Four, um, what was originally called Star Wars when it first came out, they did compare, um, the, when they were getting the budget together for making that movie, they compared it to films like Planet of the Apes and uh, films like 2001. And, um, you know, I think that does need to enter the conversation here. Also, um, you know, in, in terms of just its sustainability as a film overall. Um, You know, I will still argue that episode four 
of the Star Wars movies is of the original trilogy the, the weakest entrant in there. Of course, without Star Wars Episode Four, there would be no Star Wars franchise. I get that, and I'm not saying it's a bad film, but excuse me, compared to Planet of the Apes, overall, Planet of the Apes for me just has the better watchability and. Um, you can't. You got to take into account too. Sixty-eight. The, the just again the makeup involved that allowed the actors in the ape uh, masks to be as expressive as they were. Um, the, just the characters again overall complex characters. You think going into this, it's going to be a traditional good guy versus bad guy story, but there is a lot going on that that, that, that that's simmering underneath that that's just amazing. Whereas with Star Wars, Star Wars is a very basic hero's journey type of story. There are good guys, there are bad guys, the good guys win at the end. Again, no argument from me. If Star Wars Episode Four wins, it's a great movie. But if you are judging the two movies together, Planet of the Apes is superior to Star Wars Episode Four. And thanks to a fateful coin flip, Tim goes first and wraps up his comments on Planet of the Apes, which leaves us to Mora. Mora is heading up to the podium right now to discuss Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Let's see if she has what it takes to win this tournament. Planet of the Apes um, storyline, yes, it's great, but I'm sorry, you can't compare to Star Wars. Star Wars is something, again, it's something as a kid and as an adult you can still enjoy, and it's something, Planet of the Apes, I feel like the underlining story, the seriousness of it is something that just a child would not really enjoy. It's something that would depress the hell out of them, if not make them suicidal. Um, Star Wars is just something where it, it does, it gives hope. It's like here you have the good guys fighting this empire um, and you get people involved of all different races. So it shows, you know, how people come together. It shows how you have, again, like an average farm kid who winds up becoming like this hero and realizing there's a, the force in this whole other world. Um, you 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 have like it shows like strong female character again like Princess Leia, who is standing up to the mighty Darth Vader, who is really scary as a little kid. If you're watching this, you have this big black figure who breathes very heavily, <laughs> which you're not thinking anything perverted at this point because you're too young to think that way. But in the meantime, you're you're just seeing this character, this truly scary character, and. Granted, it's like, you know, as the sequels come out, you learn more about it, and that's the whole thing. It's like this, I get Empire, everybody loves Empire, but it wouldn't have been what it what it is without this movie. This was the baseline. This was the foundation for the whole franchise and for the whole series. Um, it is just so brilliantly well done between the acting, again, just the way the storyline progresses, and the fact they're now going back to prequels. You know, and there's always the discussion with, like, finding, like, oh, we're going to find out more about Han Solo, where who doesn't love Han Solo, which is great. That's coming out soon. And Mora wraps up her argument for Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. We bring it to the judges, folks. This is our final matchup. One of these movies will be determined to be the first ever Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever champion. And wait a minute. What is this? We actually have a judge that wants to speak. Karen is heading up to the podium right now. Let's hear what she has to say about her decision. Planet of the Apes was impacting me more. I mean, it was one of the first movies I saw as a kid that I was just like, wow. Wow. Movies can be so much more thoughtful than I had imagined. So Planet of the Apes is your choice? Yeah. All right. We have one decision under our belt. The other judges are deliberating, and we have a decision. They are sending it my way. Folks, here we go. The winner of this tournament and new Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever champion is Tim Jowsma with Planet of the Apes. And as you can hear, folks, that is a decision that is not held firm with the audience there. All right, Tim has grabbed his brand new championship belt and is heading up to the podium. He has some final comments he wants to tell the audience. Let's hear what he has to say. I would just like to say... 
to a nicer guy, it couldn't happen. And you know what? When you have such great movie choices of mine, you know you can defeat anybody. So I issue a challenge right now. I challenge anybody in the back. If you have the cojones to face me and my superior movie choices, get your ass out here right now and get the beating of your life. How reprehensible can a human being get? They just won a great tournament like this. They have their hands on a championship belt that is prestigious in this industry, and they're issuing open challenges. And Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's music. What is this? Oh, my God. It's Luke Jasmine. Luke Jasmine's running to the ring, and he has a chair. Tim is frightened beyond belief. He is trying to hide behind Mora right now of all the despicable things. But look at this. Mora elbows Tim in the face. She grabs him by the hair and throws him in Luke's direction. And look at this. Tim has been hit over the head with that chair. He collapses to the ground. Luke's get, Luke gets down on the ground and covers him for the pin. Ray runs into the ring to do the counting. One, two, three. Three and the winner of the match and new friend stalking nerdy greatest movie ever champion is Luke Jowsma. And Luke is grabbing the microphone right now. He has something he wants to say to our vanquished champion. Your only choices suck. Mora raises Luke's hand in victory, and Luke is showing everybody his new championship belt. And with that, we are finished with the first ever Friends Talking Nerdy Greatest Movie Ever Championship Tournament. Remember to, to subscribe to this podcast via iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Also support us on Patreon. If you want to hear any and all back episodes, you can also go to our website, friendstalkingnerdy.com. We will see you all next week. Your friend.